barbecue capital of the world and home of Elvis Presley. Please welcome your co-host, Bob Furness. A contact center job either finds you in a moment of need right. or you find it in a moment of need, right? Uh, I need a job. And, uh, and, and Or it could be that I'm, I'm working to an opportunity in a contact center. And from the tornado capital of the world, home of the Oklahoma Sooners, here's your co-host, Amas Tanuma. Hello and good morning. It must be Friday because we are shooting an episode of the Contact Center Show. My name is Amos. I'm your co-host and I've got my partner in crime, Bob Furness. Bob, it is awesome to see you, man. Good morning, Ma- Amos. There seems to be an extra person in the screen this morning. <laughs> there is. There is. We've got a, we've got a trifold. Um, we are shooting our very first interview. We told you guys when we launched the show, or relaunched the show this year, that we'll bring you guests, and we have our first one. We had lots of conversations about who to bring on as our first guest, but without further ado, Glenn Stoffel. Glenn, are you, can you still hear me? Yeah, I I got you, Amos. I'm, I'm honored I'm the first guest. I, I I think, uh, I've listened to a few of the episodes I didn't know there wasn't a guest. It seemed like between the two of you, it was plenty entertaining. And so I, I think Glenn is saying he didn't know there was room for a guest with, Bo- <laughs> with, with both of us. <laughs> yeah, I've been around. But Glenn, let's jump in. Um, Bob and I obviously have known you for years. And th- there is a reason that we have we have chosen Glenn. Glenn's um, founder of Camp 4 as much. And he's involved in all kinds of things. But Glenn, a quick 30 second intro. So our guests have a context where you're coming from. Bob and I refer to you as one of our top strategists anywhere in the world. Like if you are looking for a strategist, it just doesn't get better than, than, than Glenn. But I'll let Glenn introduce himself. I appreciate that, Amas. Uh, first off, Bob, I wore a special shirt for you today. Can you see that? Yes. He's love, love bacon. Dude. Uh, <laughs> sorry. There's that's, a story. That, that's, that's, that's for you, my friend. Uh, so uh, for the folks on the phone, um, I, First off, thank you guys for having me on and for for all the listeners out there, just quick context. Um, The last 20 years I spent in the salesforce.com space. So, you know, highly relevant obviously to to contact center and to both the the gentlemen on here. And our latest pivot camp four is about coming back into that salesforce.com space, but developing talent. So all around creating net new talent for that marketplace, both the technical skills that the market needs but also the the tough skills, um, which, which I love to chat with you guys about in a bit. So, that's what that's what we're up to now, and uh, excited to be here. Thank you, guys. Awesome. So, Glenn, let's let's jump in. Um, when we asked you to do this, you you sh- you shared something interesting, which I didn't know, and I've I've known you for for a number of years, which is that you've actually worked in the contact center. So this show, obviously, it's a contact center show, and everyone who's listening to this is focused on providing good experiences for customers everywhere. Uh, so, Glenn, tell me a little bit about that. How did that, I, I don't know how long ago that was. Uh, you don't have to tell us how long ago that was. But how did that shape you? Tell us about that experience. I haven't heard this story uh, before. Well, you have, uh, uh, can, can, I get a, can I get a phone ring sound? Can someone just make like a phone <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for calling Pedals. This is Glenn. How am I help you? <laughs> I still got it? You still, still got, got it. it. Still right. You're hired. You're, you're hired. All right. Well. So yeah, coming out of school, um, I worked in a, in a call center for a small um, catalog company. So this was both, you were doing sales, you were doing support, you were doing anything that anybody called about. And um, I particularly was working the graveyard shift. So middle of the night. Um, okay, yes, there might have been a, the color palette that filled my field of vision for the most part was black in green so yeah i'll give you a little a little dating there yes it was the color palette so the true, the true meaning to a green screen and in, in, environment right yes literal <laughs> yes and um you know so first off shout out to everybody out there who's listening who's ever worked uh those shifts um you know i learned a very valuable lesson about that about what it's like to try to live as a human being with everybody else on a different shift and a different kind of cadence and what that did to you <laughs> mentally it's hard 
And so shout out to everybody out there who's uh, who, who's worked on that. Um, I'd say that the other thing for me that it it uh, it taught me how to think on my feet, or actually actually technically I was thinking on my seat. Um, this is this is before stand up desks also, but uh, and, and I think you know that aspect to um, be prepared, but be very flexible because you don't know what's coming at you has definitely served me well in, in, in the consulting business as, as, as we grew. Um, listening skills, you know, being able to react, but also being able to follow process and structure that sits underneath it, definitely foundational for me. And um, so, yeah, I look, I look back on that fondly. Not the graveyard shift part, but, but what, what it taught me about how to work with customers, for sure. Uh, that, yeah. that, that, that's awesome. So um, the the most memorable time or the most memorable, well, other than the bacon incident, which we won't go into, um, but the other most memorable time for me with you, Glenn, was when you spent a day with me in a room in New York City in a conference room, um, and we were trying to get the concept of what we were doing around service through the lens of Salesforce into a set of words and strategy and vision that that we could duplicate and make relevant to the people we were talking to in the sales environment and it just it just imprinted on me the value of 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 strategy why do you think strategy is so important to both the organization and then to the smaller groups to the contact center yeah i mean i Important strategy, but let me get to that second. Let, let's talk about the process that you and I went through first to get there, because I think that there's that that's really where to start that. And, you know, you guys have said some kind words about me about strategy, but the reality, Bob, I got to let you in on something. You know, my recollection of that day is I didn't bring a new idea to you. If you really think about what happened in that session, I asked you a lot of questions. I clarified what you were saying and forced you to clarify back to me what you meant. And we found some words that really sort of synthesized and you know gave a, a, a focus to the ideas that that you had. Like you were the expert, and really you were facilitated. And and the the point of that is, I became I was a sparring partner for you. And I think as 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 people in leadership anywhere in contact centers especially are thinking about like what do they do to try to get to clarity around their strategy. We'll talk about why that's important in a moment. Having somebody to spar with who can be a bit neutral, um, you know, if somebody's got some facilitation skills and knows how to draw people out and, 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 and ask reflective questions. But that's really what we did there is we just put some clarity on, on, on all the ideas you already had and on the knowledge you had about what we needed to do in that in that marketplace. And I think leaders need a little bit of a sparring partner, you know, when it comes to those moments, because it's not what they're doing every single day. They're solving the problems of their business. So, and, and Glenn, is, isn't it also one thing you said about words is this business we are in of basically there is a customer who needs help. All you have a lot of times are your words, right? Like you're going to disappoint me because my shipment then isn't here. There's like even more so, right, Glenn, on in this work where what you're really doing ultimately is figuring out how to communicate with a set of human beings. And generally, if they're calling you customer service, they're likely already disappointed or going to be disappointed. So being thoughtful about what you do and what you don't do um, is important. And I find our industry tends to be a shoot first industry. Go, go, go. And doesn't take the time to pause, think and, and reflect. So I, 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 how do you think, especially for us in this space, I think it's even more important um, and to hear you say, you know, picking those words and all of that, that we're in a communications business, so it's even more more, more critical. I mean, I, I think that that go, go, go and react piece is, is, is always going to be a feature. The question is, what are you arming your people with that sort of becomes foundational to allow them to do that in such a way that more often than not, they're going to be executing in a way that's consistent with where you want them to go. So starting out with the strategy is, do we have clarity about how we're going to communicate the way we're going to treat customers, what our goals are, so that in that moment, which can be fraught with emotion coming at them, <laughs> never mind the emotion they brought to the, to the table that day from their, right. from their family, from wherever else, right? 
Um, with all with all that frontness of emotion, how do you put them in a position to feel like they can make good decisions? The, the more clear you can articulate the company strategy, how we treat customers, the better. Amos, you, you were um, talking about on the last podcast is that you guys were debating. I love this one about like the the delighting customers versus the um, is it seamless experience? So I got that right. Ever, effortless, effortless, yeah. Yes. Okay, and um, and this idea that you know if you, if you delight them every single time, you're probably not within the bounds of your the financial responsibility as a company. Um, but but I do but I do think that um, their ability to discern when you might want to go that extra mile is, is, is also predicated on the clarity of the strategy that you've articulated to them about like what you mean by delight, right? I could say delight to 10 people, right? I got 10 people with the illusion of agreement. Right. Delight is very different to all those people, unless you took the time to unpack very succinctly, this is what we mean by delighting customers. Here's the process we follow. And there might be some rule-based stuff in there. It's okay to have rules. <laughs> towards delight. I think that was the balance you guys were sort of sparring over, you know? Um, so so yeah. I think that's the importance of, of how strategy plays in. It's just about the clarity that you can communicate that puts them in a position, you know, to, to do that more often than not. I, I just want to make sure that, that you grasp what Glenn said about the sparring partner, because I've often said that if you're if you're a mid-level or, or or a director of a contact center, the, some of the most important time of your week is the 30 minutes that you sit down at a Starbucks in front of a cup of coffee at home, where, wherever that is, and spend some time thinking about what your week's going to be like and what your what your strategy for the week is. But but, but would you added a, a a clarifying factor in that? I could have walked into a, a, that same conference room and written out what was in my mind on the whiteboard. But what you did as a sparring partner was clarify. And so in addition to that 30 minutes or that hour that you spend in, in thinking about what your, what your plan should be, you need somebody to bounce off uh, what that reality is and how to, how to do that. Is that true? Yeah. And, you know, we even take it to a finer degree and you got to think about this, like a good workout, like, what we what we went through and we did a, a, a 30 word strategy statement for the company overall. Um, and again, this could be done at a at a group level, at a team level, et cetera. The reason is not to have this thing that somebody's gonna memorize like the Pledge of Allegiance, <laughs> you know, like even though I probably could re recite a couple of them that I've written over the years. That's not the point. The point is you fought over every single word. So Amas, your your point on all you have is words, yeah, that's it. That is all you have. But fighting over those words so there's no illusion of agreement about what we mean by that and why we chose those and the emotion you pack in that and how it brings your company values to life you go through that so that again when you communicate it you, you can just read a statement somebody's like that sounds good but when you unpack it and say this is why we chose to talk about you know inspired clarity you guys might remember like you know part of the blue wolf like thing inspired clarity I'm like that's beautiful marketing words that's a lovely sentiment and it is and it was also true but where does inspired come into a, to a methodology? Like by design, if you are not in your methodology, then bringing forward inspiration into, into um, a presentation to a customer, you're not living the brand. So anyway, fighting over those words matters. The exercise of going through that is, is really the, the muscle that's being, that's being built. You know? I, I couldn't agree more. I remember, you know, I was part of you doing strategy statement uh, at one point or the other you know a few years ago and i was i was part of the team you were leading it was, it was doing that and one of the things that stuck out to me today is that I, I i these days think of strategy as figuring out what you are not less it, like because when the whole thing starts right <laughs> like it's you just put it's it was just like we're not this we're not this and when you strip all the things that you're kind of not who you are and what your company what you stand for comes to um bears fruit i mean bob and i have been in plenty of conversations where we're talking to a client who is like i want to be world-class customer service but i want this to be the cheapest thing ever thinking the same thing maybe maybe that becomes a thing maybe it isn't but it is congruous that look but when you start when we start asking them more and more questions very quickly, I remember an incident, Bob and I were in somewhere on the East Coast, I can't remember. And when we were done, I remember the client going, okay, 
maybe not world class, but can we get like good, great? <laughs> like they they start because we yeah. started stripping it and we we got to the place. So to that point, let's talk about culture because uh, this is the thing uh, is why I'm I so excited to talk to you and not just here but in general because I I feel like I get clarity. Talk about culture and the work you're doing there. And more importantly, whether the work you're doing or in general, why is culture till this day, I've been hearing this thing about culture, like why is it still king? Why is it that if you get this thing wrong, almost nothing else works? And oh, by the way, where does the strategy and the culture just play together? I just think there is a, there is a, there, there's a reason why, Glenn, you do strategy. And I saw you really, really focused on culture on your own organization and helping organizations as well. Why have you keyed in on those those two areas as a critical part part for success? Yeah, as as far as the you know strategy helping clarify like what you're not like you know you guys called out like why like we're, can we really be world class like that you, you want somebody who's going to call that out because the lens with which you're going to be judged is not your aspirational words. Yep. It's the reality of what you actually do and what the culture actually feels, right? And and you and by the way, sorry to say, uh, and I got to break a couple people's hearts on this call right now. Uh, if you're in leadership, management, executive call center, you're not part of the culture. Mm. Sorry, uh, that that was actually the most heartbreaking thing I ever heard at Blue Wolf. When we we had, a, we had a guy called Stan. <laughs> Get that in the call notes. Okay, um, I got it. I got we're, it. We're, we're, we're culture, but like, you're not part of the culture. Culture happens w- without you. Uh, uh, un- unpack that for us it's just really, really quickly. <laughs> Again, I, I'm going to paraphrase, but, I'll, but you guys can put a reference to Stan Slap, uh, who wrote great books on this. Um, your culture is, 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 is your employees. It's, it's, it's the way they perceive who they are and how you come to work. And yes, you could set the tone for that. And you definitely set with your strategy clearly how you expect them to act with customers and, and manifest that. Um, but culture is not something that you dictate from the top down. Culture is something that is that you hopefully can can influence and you know harness and you know feed into. So and culture if culture works in reverse, so you have to sort of build your culture um, in some ways like manifest into your strategy. You know? But yeah, you're not part of it as the executive team. You lead it, but you're not part of it. Right. right. And, right. and you can't, and you can't, it sounds to me like it's almost like it's this fire that's burning, right? Like you've, you, it, you can't control it, right? Like you, you can influence it. You can't just write a memo and say our culture is going to be X, Y, and Z, hit send, and voila, it's done. Like it's <laughs> like, it's like, I think, I think we, we say Twitter, your customers own your brand on Twitter. Right, like they they get to decide what it is. So that's it. That's interesting. That I I never thought about it that way before. I, 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 it reminded me of there's two there's two um, when you have a new employee there's two onboarding sessions. There's the onboarding session that you give them in the training class, and then there's the onboarding session that happens in the break room the first time they're sitting with a whole bunch of employees. <laughs> that's a little bit about what you're saying is yeah, that actually, and, and that's your culture your culture is what we, we talk about among ourselves not necessarily what we what we stratify or or put on a, on a board and part of what could make a a, a, a rift or a, just a, a, a distinction between those two things is the reality that they experience relative to the words that you said right the word the words that you came out and you said at the beginning and then they're like yeah but here's the way it really works Okay, well then maybe when we were writing our strategy, we didn't appropriately look at what was aspirational and call out and say, guys, like we're choosing this word. We know it's aspirational. Here's the things we're putting in place that we think are gonna move us towards that. We know we're not all the way there yet. So a big part of that is how you communicate it and are you honest with what is aspirational? It's okay to be aspirational. Like hopefully we are and they're inspired by that. If you're you're tying into what your culture really values, they're inspired by that, but you have to call out the reality of where you are, because that's how you'll be judged. And if you do that, and then communicate in context, like here's why we're making this decision, you know, and here's what our strategy is, th- those conversations in the break room potentially get a little more close together to what you might have intended. Second thing, if some of those people in the break room 
are involved in the very process by which you curate your strategy, yeah, uh, you also tend to close that gap. And that's not Pollyanna, like, like just you know, like, like it's not. Sorry, that's probably not the right word, but it, it's it's not like a like a just sprinkle it in type of thing. It has to be systemic. You know, it's not how do you, you can't can't just have lip service to bringing the person in. You've got to get involved. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and when you start to do that. And they and they might feature and factor in the communication of it, you know, get them on stage talking about you know, this is why you know we influenced you know the direction of the company. I think you also have the ability to bring that 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 gap between those two perceptions closer, you know, which uh, which should fan the flames in a positive way of, of, the, of the culture, but also drive the business forward in a in a way that's going to make some sense. So so we used to struggle in the contact center space with that concept that you had 300 or 400 people, you know, that owned who you were as a, in a call center, you've got a, a, a small stratosphere of different types of people, different levels of education, different eco, social economic, like you've got all this to work with. Now, in, in the post COVID, we expect that there's going to be a work from home effort. Uh, that, that we're going to stay at home. Uh, Amas and I sort of believe that. And and the more I talk in the contact center space and read, at least a portion of that's never coming back. So obviously in how I hire or how I onboard or how I in, in, enable in that work from home space is going to be even, uh, it's going to be harder than trying to control the 300 people in the same room. It, it, it's going to be controlling 300 ideas individually. So any insight into into that? Uh, well, insight, <laughs> you, you be the judge, but I'll give you a couple of things that, I, that I'm watching people do with technology to try to um, bring together those interaction points, you know, um, in, in virtual ways. Um, one of the tools that, that, that we use um, is called Mural, and it's an online digital collaboration tool, whiteboarding tool. Um, and you know, you're watching people, uh, use that in those situations, like I was talking about where they're trying to get input into strategy or they're doing a sales kickoff or a training session for, for their call center. Um, but you know, those tools need to be combined with techniques. So when you get those people into those virtual environments, first off, everybody's sick of zoom. Um, I'm not, but this is great. Just kidding guys. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you get them into those environments, you have to um, do some things socially. You have to leave space for icebreakers. You know, we, we just did a, a big training session for, for a customer of ours. And because of COVID, these were the first sessions where a lot of these people met. And you guys can remember, we used to bring people together physically at Blue Wolf. I think it was one of the things that I think we did really well that, that built the culture was, was bringing people together. And in this environment, you take your your employees to St. Thomas, the culture gets better. So just, <laughs> yes. just, just talking about the Blue Wolf culture, anytime that happens, the culture has gotten better. So sorry, I interrupted you. So, so, somewhere, Bob, there's a, somebody's going to be quoting you 20 years down the line with that, that stage quote. <laughs> you build culture, bring your people to St. Thomas. Um, but it's interesting, in, in this environment, um, you need to still bring people together but it can be a little exhausting and you have to really be clever with how you use these tools and not just make it about the education piece of it, the inspiration piece of it. Like one of the biggest comments that that company made, the employees of that company made was in addition to, Hey, this is really helping us with our tough skills, you know, with, with client engagement skills. This is, these have been great exercises. I got to interact with some of my peers I haven't met before. Mm. And so we built into our agenda, the space, either through when they're in a breakout session, just letting it go 20 minutes versus 15, because we know that if they finish, they're going to sit there and chat with one another. And there's value to the business and them getting to know each other, right? Um, or with, with very specific icebreakers where we actually put people together who haven't met before on purpose to sort of facilitate the, the water cooler kind of you know uh, thing of the past. So I think what, what contact centers are going to need to do as, as that trend goes, goes virtual is get really good at those types of interactions and facilitating them and curating them with, with care that the intent of them, oh, no, the core intent of something might be, say, education. The other intent needs to be community building, culture building, you know, or, you know, those social things. 
have to be constructed into those interactions. And the, the tools are getting really good to do it, but um, it takes it, it takes some thought. So, so Glenn, I want to I want to I want to pivot really quickly to a related topic. And, and by the way, and if you're just listening, if you're just joining in the middle of this, um, you're listening to the Contact Center show. We've got Glenn Stoffel, our first guest on the show, um, a, a, a favorite strategist, one of the best in the world. Um, and we've been having this conversation focused really around strategy and culture. And it surprised me a little bit because you guys, we're, we're going to put Glenn's bio up. Glenn is a tech guy. And we've not said one word about technology yet. So I, 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 I want to go there and, and talk a little bit about, I have noticed your shift, and maybe it's not a shift, but it just seems noticeable to me that your focus has gone to these things. And, and I think you guys call them tough skills. They used to be called soft skills and uh, tough skills. Why a guy who is in tech are you focused on, and you're a technologist, culture and and, and and again, what are tough skills? I would love for you to just sort of break that down. Uh, but I, I want you to start by just explaining why, make it make sense. Why for a technology focused company, you're over here focusing on the soft skills or tough skills. Uh, I, I suspect there is a reason for that. I would love for you to sort of just lay out why everyone else should just focus on it too. <laughs> Yeah, for sure, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about our current context of why it's important, but I think we can extrapolate that out towards the, the general audience who's, who's listening for, for their particular domains. Um, first off, the, the reason for calling them tough skills and what, what are they? They're, they're, the, they're the things that everybody historically might have called soft skills, but if, if folks on the call and you guys will join me in this, we need to obliterate the phrase soft, you know, from yeah. soft skills. Amen. Yeah. Here, 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 here. Amen to that. Because they're they're the least likely to be explicitly taught, and I'm talking about throughout the entire education spectrum, right? And this is foundational, really foundational um, education system all the way up and through corporate education. Um, they're the least likely to be explicitly taught, but they're the most challenging to master. And what they represent in technology is, is sort of the following: that you know, the, the technology is is being used to do what. It's being used to, in your case, better facilitate the interaction between your company and your customer, right? At the end of the day, technology should be being used, not a mean, it's, you know, it's a means to an end. What is the end? Well, the end is that I can get a better, you know, customer act, interaction. It's interesting when you, when you guys think about like, um, I'll take you a little bit on a, on a field trip, but if you, you think about like AI, right? What does AI represent at its core? Well, if you talk to a technologist, it's like, I can take the next best action. What does that mean? I could know who to call next, or I could know how to discern how I should talk to this person based upon things I'm learning that AI is teaching me, right? So, um, you know, aspects of, um, you know, um, what they call, uh, you know, aspects of like what, what you're hearing, tone and, and, you know, all those types of things, right? Right, sentiment and all that, yeah. Sentiment. Thank you, that was the word I was, I was leaving for. So, um, but what are you really after? Not after the next best action, Right, you're after the next best interaction, and that entails that once that 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 software put you in a position to make that next best call or to know that hey, this person's pissed off. I better <laughs> you know guide my tone in a certain way, right? And 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 you know, can glove this thing, right? Maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm looking for a moment of delight here, right? Um, like I'm hearing that. Then a human being has to potentially, hopefully, and I, I also heard your guys' thing on chatbots, so <laughs> take, that, take that aside. But a human being at some point is going to have going to talk to somebody. Now, what have we done to train those human beings who, as you guys said earlier, can come from all walks of life, different backgrounds, different schooling, different industries, different home situations, different everything, right? Like this, the nature of, of, of the, the market that you guys are, are, are talking to and, and serving. Um, what, what's what's our role in helping them be more empathetic, in helping them be a better listener, in helping them rephrase to a customer? I think I heard you just say this. Let me clarify before we move on. Little techniques of, of interaction. Those are tough skills, right? Yeah. Those are those are the things where man, when when you guys know it, and you, you and sometimes and you guys know this because you probably you're going to get in some population of, of call center people, you're going to get some of this naturally, more naturally than others. Everybody's on a spectrum with these types of things. 
but I'm very convinced that they can be instructed and taught and broken down into components and no matter where you are naturally, some people are naturally more empathetic, that is true. Um, where, no matter where you are, you can build those muscles up in the same way that you can build the muscles up for tech. And where tech can fall down or maybe get the blame is like is it the system's fault that, that we didn't improve our, 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 uh, you know, our, our call rates or whatever, whatever metric we're being held to. Or as some of that was some of that at the moment of, of, of interaction that we could have improved by building the, the, the human skills, the tough skills into the folks. That, so that's why I think it's, it's important. And one last soapbox thing, I'm a big believer that the worlds of personal and professional development need to come screaming together with urgency, particularly in this moment in time. And um, you know, I, I do think it's corporate responsibility to do that as well as the education system, but, but, that, but that's why I believe in it. That's why, that's why we do it, make successful projects, but also, you know, we're gonna improve some people's, uh, th those are skills that are transferable. Yeah. They go with yeah. you for the rest of your life. So, so, you, you, sorry, sorry, I, I, I just wanted right. one, one quick thing. Um, so what's interesting about what you said through the lens of the, the last couple of interviews that I've been in. So, so we're a technology company also, but what's to me, I'm looking for in a, in a technologist is the ability to run a room or run a Zoom, right? It's, and, and I think sometimes in customer, in the call center, we worry about the wrong things or, or we, we haven't instructed our, our recruiters to worry about the right things. Maybe that's a better way to say it. Because once I get you in that room and I'm, I'm training you and I'm building you up, I, you still have to have the emotional intelligence or the ability to be that kind of person. Uh, how, how do you how do you combat? How do we make sure that we're hiring the right people that will then move towards that right culture, which moves towards that ability to to be both technology savvy and human savvy? Yeah, I mean, first off, and this is the first time I'm really thinking this, but when I when I hear that phrase, emotional intelligence, I I, I want to pause because. It, I think it could get misconstrued that like you got it or you don't, or somebody's just this much smarter than the reality is like, it's, it's about progression. Right. And um, so I don't, I don't want to make that like a binary, like, Oh, okay. Right. People are all, all across there, but I'm a big believer in the same way that somebody can, you know, go, go do a workout and get better at something or start walking to get fit or whatever it happens to be. These are just, these are muscles that can be built up and you got to meet, that people where they are and, and help them, you know, help them progress. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, you but did. you did, you did. And, and that's what you guys do is help make that happen. Right. Yeah. Well, I think just think it's part and parcel to any technology deployment. Like, you know, again, it's, I, I think that, I, I mean, I gave you guys that, that little phrase, but I, it's, it's purposely, it's purposely used the next best interaction mm. take away. It's, not just next best action, like that could be very robotic, very, you know, you know, very AI interaction. It's got yeah, to be, be up on, that'll be up on my Twitter site within 20 minutes after this yeah. conversation. <laughs> that, was, just, that was profound. I saw Amat's writing down. Just, just, just give me a little, you know, just give me a little, give me a little quote. quote, quote so there for let, let, look, I will, uh, you know, on this topic, the Glenn, the reason why I'm, I'm just beaming and it's, this some music to my ears is because you know, we've literally said customer service is harder than rocket science. And, and, and the reason we believe that is because there are actual formulas that can get a, you know, a rocket into space. Not that it's easy, but there, you can calculate the whole thing. But put two strangers on a call, on an email, in a room. There, there's like, so the... The, the notion that you won't focus on what Glenn is saying, it's like even your technology needs to be human, needs to have all these tough skills as well. Like even if you're the person building it, the technology itself, all of it needs this thing because we just know, like when you put two people in a room or da da da, strangers, randomly, by the way, this is what the contact center is, the contact center randomly gets this person and puts them together and says, Voila, let's hope this all goes good. Uh, <laughs> like investing in teaching this these people. And to Bob's point, we waste all this time 
saying we're not going to hire Joe because Joe can't use the system. Well, fix your system, make the system easier so that anyone can do it. Because if Joe can be taught to have these kinds of interactions, that's the thing you're hiring Joe for, not his ability to click or doing any of that kind of thing. So it's, it's this upside down view that I was like, oh, of course you need to focus on it. It is hard. It is hard. So that's why I was just like, just, just beaming because you've articulated in a very different way that will, that will help us really just convince and get more people to, to this side of the fence. I think on your effortless, I, I love, I love that that picture, which you guys should continue to use of like two strangers randomly getting set up. Let's see how it goes. That's awesome. Because like all of a sudden everybody can visually go, Oh, I can see where that's fraught with. Those two people during their days that could possibly cause, you know, any challenges now, because and what's, yeah, what's cool about that is that, um, okay. Uh, I forget the boxer whose, whose, whose quote was like, everybody's got a great plan until they get punched I in the face. Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson. <laughs> Which is like one of the, I, I love that. I love that quote um, because it, it's another one of those visceral, like, okay, yes, you can also, by the way, prep these people, et cetera, et cetera. But if you are prepping them with more of those skills that allow them to 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 duck, dodge, and weave, or whatever the the verbal equivalent of that is for your uh, piece, like, it, it, there's a, it's it's not just the systems that they're going to need to navigate right. to do that. Yes, man, don't don't. Don't um, don't hold me back because of because of the system. Um, like we should talk about agent shadowing in a quick second. But uh, because of the system, yes, please make that as seamless as possible. Because I don't need the extra issues. Right. I have to deal with that random stranger that I was just put on the phone with and all of their emotional challenges or whatever whatever it is they're trying to solve. Maybe it's a complex. Maybe it's not emotional at all. Maybe it's just a complex scenario that they haven't heard of before. Either way, I've got to be sharp. So, so make sure the technology is not a not a hindrance. Make sure it's a, it's a help. Exactly. Yeah. But what am I doing to help my people just get better at, at duck dodging and weaving when they're about to get punched in the face or after they already did? <laughs> right. Like that's 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 tough skills. You know. That's that's why it's critical. What do you do when your contact center agent gets punched in the face? That 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 that's the. <laughs> that's, you've that's all felt, you've all felt it. You know. You're probably having a great day. Some customer gets on the phone and boom, like you're just, you're, your stomach drops. Like, you know, as if your mother yelled at you when you were five, like you just, all those emotions come flooding back into you. And you gotta, you know, what, what are we doing to help people, you know, navigate that? I think that's, I think that's a, a huge part of it. I agree. And Bob, I'm, I'm running out of time. I've got about five minutes left. So I wanna go to questions. Um, if you wanna, if you wanna take that, Bob. The questions. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd be glad to take it if I was prepared for it. What, what <laughs> are you looking for? <laughs> so let me take it. We have a question about implementing. Bob just got punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Bob just got punched in the face. And I, I just here absorbing the fact that we've redefined the, the reality of, of, of AI by that one quote. And then we brought in a quote from Mike Tyson to talk about working in a contact center. I think our work is done, actually. <laughs> I, think, I think we've nailed down what the whole session should be about, those two things. But we're, anyway, we're, we're that, what's, your, what's your question for Glenn, Amos? Because I've got a bunch of them, but I don't know if you have time for all of them. So no, no, I'll we, go first. We do not have time. I was going to audience question. I want to get I want to get the audience question for Glenn, and then let's go to quotes. So, so, so Glenn... Uh, for someone out there, we're paraphrasing, who is looking to implement contact center technology, whatever that might be, CRM, it really doesn't matter. Um, I think you'll be a good person to answer this because we've we've taken this walk with you um, in our in our in our past lives. What advice do you have someone who is I'm looking to go do technology? Obviously, they're going to do the usual, hire someone to do it. What what other things should they be thinking about? to make sure this is not another throwing money at a problem that doesn't solve any. Yeah, I mean, to me, the, the, the thing that, that comes through is, um, and again, the people who are typically making these decisions are at the business executive level, and, and they're trying to move you know, company forward, metrics forward, or they're sitting within uh, technology who are trying to do that business thing, but also manifest the right tech to, to make it happen. I think what happens, the bigger the organization, 
and the higher up that that comes from, uh, the least likely those people have a real visceral idea of what it is your people go through day in and day out when those two random strangers are put together. Um, and my anecdote for that, my antidote, an antidote for that is is um, is an agent shadow. Mm. Um, I can recall, you know, I, I went out to um, to a call center in Pittsburgh, and I sat next to a um, a rep for a pharmaceutical company who was taking inbound calls, um, product questions, and you know, challenges from consumers. And this is a 30 year person. I mean, this is one of their best. They didn't they didn't sit me with the new guy. They sat me with like, all right, you're gonna sit with Mary. She's freaking awesome. And you know, they're trying to show off a little bit. Let me tell you something. If 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 you close your eyes and you listen to Mary's call with that customer, right? It's like uh, it visualize like a duck going across a, a water. Man, it's smooth as anything. It's beautiful. If you open your eyes, what you would have seen was while Mary was taking that call and beautifully with her voice, like making it sound really smooth and not skipping a beat for the customer, she had turned around twice, grabbed product off the shelf, read, read a label that was like a font that nobody can freaking read. You know, you guys don't know what I'm talking about. You know, I know I'm a little older, but uh, you know, no, nobody could read. She's reading it right to try to to try to answer a question, you know, about the product. Uh, pivoting over to her other screen where, where their back end system was trying to get some information that she needed to look up on something, you know, hitting mute and going, hey, Mary, you ever heard this before? Like the system itself was like hamstringing her, but she was so good at compensating for it. And and, and unless um, I had sat next to her and watched that, maybe if I just listened to it, it'd be like, it seems like no problem, man. That customer was psyched. It, it, was, it was cordial, it was a beautiful conversation. But what I watched was somebody getting really good at compensating for poorly designed systems and process that wasn't putting information right in the path of, of her natural conversation, which would have meant just as good of an interaction, positive, you know, great tone, great bedside manner, if you will, but probably would happen a lot quicker. Uh, and she could have done more of them. So, so that that rep ride, it, like, it, you know, uh, rep or rep and sorry, I'm, I'm using the sales side of that equation as a rep ride going out with selling sales reps, but in the contact center and agent shadow, uh, I can't stress enough the importance of that uh, experience for anybody designing this a system and for the execs who are funding it. Wow. Wow. That last one, the, hold, hold on. That last one was important too. For the execs who are funding the session, f funding the, 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 the technology, if they went and spent more time understanding what, what their people are going through, they might fund it a little differently, a little better. Is that is that what you meant by that? Yeah, and Bob, uh, all the consultants out there right now are about to kick me under the table because, like, if you, <laughs> if you if you play this card and the execs don't, you got something they don't, which is you have had sat down and got that first hand experience, and you can narrate not just all the good strategic ways that this platforms this this this, but you can be like, when I sat with Joe, let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what I observed. Let me tell you what this means to them. Which is which is how you're going to win hearts and minds when the users have to actually use the system and it improves their lives because that's also the the reality of the of the payout of that. Maybe I shouldn't have said that because now the execs are, are going to you know know that the consultants are using that as a, as a as a trick to make a better system. Well, um, let's, and, let's, and, flip and, it, and let's flip it to our audience too. If if I'm a manager, if I if I'm a director of a contact center and I'm trying to sell the the, the next level up on technology. I, I don't want to talk about what the technology is going to do. I want to talk about how it's going to improve what happens in my with my agent. So sitting with the agent and understanding the the iterations they're going through, like you saw Mary, the, the duck that's paddling as fast as they can underneath the water, telling that story at, helps me get a better response from executives. So so that that also is reality on the internal side. Well, it's, it's that story combined with what I could discern from how much time that was wasting or how many more customers she could have talked to and doing a little bit of the math that then ties me to the business outcomes and the strategic yeah. that, that was probably driving that business side of the exec to, to want to make the change. But when you've got the power of that narrative first person sort of story with the dollars and cents impact with, yeah, okay, this is cool technology. Here's where we've done it elsewhere. Now you've got what people need to go and defend because that's the other thing that's happening in technology, people are saying, I want to spend some of the company money. Here's why I think we should be spending this money to go have this impact. And I think you need all those lenses to really make people comfortable that they're going to put they're putting their career in the line. I'm going to go spend a lot of money to, to improve this thing. You know, those are the stories that I want to have, you know, in my arsenal that make everybody go, yep, this makes sense. 
Wow. Well, we're, we're that, that's the magic of Glenn. I'm <laughs> talking about a duck doing this. He adds clarity of what that really means. <laughs> we came full circle from the very first conversation right there at that point. Don't let him fool you. He was doing more than clarifying what I was saying. He, was, he adds value with his conversations. <laughs> Look, this this is this has been awesome, and we're gonna get to quotes here. But I, uh, for those of you listening, and and by the way, we hit. You know, we you know we relaunched the show. We got we got a high watermark of 2,400 downloads is our peak now, uh, most downloads in one episode. So we appreciate the love and and hopefully that means we're delivering value. But one of the things I hope we're doing is trying to prepare you for what's to come. And the reason why this conversation with Glenn, I was so looking for it is I believe, and I think Bobby will agree with me that you know this whole convenience era of customer experience, which is the Amazonization of everything. Every company is going to be doing two-day shipping now. Every company is going to be doing returns because, you know, the story Bob told one episode, he tried to do a return at a company that didn't have Amazon-like deal. He's never shopping there again. So that company, everyone is going to do. This is about what happens when everyone is delivering convenience. Like, that's what we are talking about. Everyone is going to catch up to that. And I got to believe if you are wanting to have that edge, it's not in that anymore. It's here. Like after you've done all the convenience, made it more than that, it is all here. How good are you at connecting with the human being? Because believe it or not, we're still in the convenience deal. All, when people tell me how much they love Amazon, it's not visceral, it's convenience. It's like, I don't have to, I don't, they, the, the, the next leg of this, I believe is this next thing because everyone is gonna be doing convenience. So we hope that you're, you know, really paying attention and doing that because, you know, we, we think we're here to kind of help you guide, guide you through the wilderness. And Glenn, I'd love your reaction to that sort of deal of like this, as it all gets in, what's left? I think it's, it's what you're talking about. That would be the next battleground for hearts and minds and wallets, I think. Yeah. Um, interaction, right? And yeah. that, that's implicitly human and you have to be as, um, specific and uh, intent as you would be in making good technology choices as building up you know, your people to be able to have those great interactions. And I don't think societally, educationally, it's, it's ingrained in any way, shape or form. Um, uh, it, or there's at least a lot of room for, for improvement. And I, I do think it's, it's what's gonna make the difference. I think, I think AI is gonna be a, you know, a, a all ships rising tide kind of situation. And at some point you're, you're at your level set. You both got to that to that to that next best call. You both got and understood that that customer was pissed off. Who wins? <laughs> Who delights? Right. That, right. It, to, to, it, that that's that's where that's where it goes. I I, I agree. All right, let's um, let's let's round out the show with where we usually end, which is words of wisdom. I didn't come prepared with anyone today, but I think it seemed. It seems fitting to to choose the is it culture eats strategy for breakfast? Am I butchering that one? It's I think that's the quote. Uh, but to me, to me, it's like what I what I relearned today. What became really just apparent is like guys, these soft skills. Stop using that term. These tough skills. We have to make that a focus. And as contact center people, we've always talked about it. But we were the ones who probably invented the word soft skills. It feels like, right, Bob, we heard soft skills, soft skills, soft skills, soft skills. Soft skills. Yeah. But implicitly, we always knew it was hard. And uh, it, it took the folks like Glenn and, and, and his organization to really brand this thin tough skills, which, which I think is more, is more apt. So that's my quote today. Bob, you, you got one for us? I got one. Morris Chang said that uh, without strategy, execution is aimless. And without execution, strategy is useless. Yeah. Uh, so lo love that, that that was what we want people to come up, come away from is, is that you, you start at strategy, yep. but, but it's the execution of that strategy and the details of that strategy. By the way, I, I talked to a customer this week, 60, 60 minute hold times due to post COVID travel opportunities, right? How are we going to fix that? By the way, strategy doesn't fix 60 minute phone calls, 60 minute hold times in a week or in a month. Strategy is something you do when you don't have 60 minute wait times. 
because then you have a way to execute when there are, there are problems. So um, that, 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 that's my words today. Glenn, you want to go last? Oh, you need a quote? Yeah, give us a quote. Uh, it's going to be yours. Interaction. I mean, come on, you've been a machine. You've been, he's already part. giving us four. I'll, Bob. I'll, I'll give you one of my, one of my favorite quotes. Um, and that's, uh, and I think this is um, right for where we are in the world. I think it's right for, you know, setting those, those strangers up for, you know, that random interaction that you guys so beautifully put in my brain. Uh, and that's uh, look not back in anger, nor forward in fear, but around you in awareness. Wow. Wow. That's strong. That's wow. good. It's uh, James, James, James Thurber. Wow. I don't know who he is, but he has a lot of quotes. And that's, <laughs> that's, one, that's one that's always uh, stuck with me. And, uh, you know, sits at, sits at the intersection of is somebody able to sit there and actually be aware of what that customer is saying and, you know, be conscious and present. So that's, uh, that's part of a tough skill as well. Yeah, awesome. Well, Glenn, we cannot thank you enough. Um, thank you so much for joining. Uh, Bob, this was awesome again. Thanks, uh, Bob. I, I got to give give you credit for, uh, for for landing this one. This was a big first get. Um, I, I, I learned a lot and I know our audience will will learn a lot as well. Bob? <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. Glenn. Thanks, Appreciate Glenn. It was an absolute pleasure, guys. Keep up the good work. Right. We all will right. we will have you back, Glenn, and uh, yes. thank you all for listening. We'll 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 see you all next week. We want to thank you for joining us on this episode of the Contact Center Show. If you would like to join the conversation, please visit us at contactcenter.tv. That is contact center all one word dot tv, or you can simply subscribe wherever you get your podcast. This has been a Beyond Production.